Hello, welcome to Meanwhile at the Castle. I'm Queen Emily. You'll see Queen Deborah in just a minute, and we are queens of our castles keeping the domestic arts alive. It is Friday, March 26th, I believe, yes. <laughs> and we are in extraordinary circumstances, so our podcast is going to be a little bit different than our normal um our normal format where we're both here together. Deborah and I, as much as we love each other, we are being safe and practicing our social distancing. So she will be recording her section separate, but we are excited to share with you and with each other all the projects we've been working on and just some information about how we are all getting through these kind of crazy times. Deborah and I both know that we are far more interesting when we are together than when we are separate. So this will be a little bit different, but we are excited to talk to you. And we really wanted to still be able to connect with each other and with you, our friends, and um, just have something bright to to share with, with each other, put out there in the world. So our format is going to be a little bit different. First of all, for those of you who are new, um, Deborah and I both live in the Salt Lake City area of Utah in the United States. And um, we like to share our knitting, our crochet, our sewing, a variety of other crafty things. Um, and just in case you're wondering where to find us, um, you can find us both on Instagram and um, you can also find my site at yarnbrary.com. And all, I believe all that contact information is below. Deborah is the magnificent uh, video editor for our podcast. And so she's the one who makes everything come together really well. So um, thank you to Deborah. So anyway, a little life update from Deborah, first of all. Wow, what a month it has been. Wow, since the last time we met, um, there was a lot of change coming for a lot of the world, but we really couldn't foresee exactly what that meant for um, my, for each of us, for myself, for my family. So a lot of things have happened with the coronavirus. I've got this little string here, it's driving me crazy. But it's just been a whirlwind, just like everybody else, just like everyone else. Um, on March 18th here in Utah, we had a 5.7 magnitude earthquake at 7.09 in the morning. And it was in Magna, it was the epicenter, and that is two small towns away from where I live, so very close. That's where my parents live. And while 5.7 isn't, you know, massive in the whole scheme of things, it was, it was unsettling for sure. And one of the things that um, we really quickly realized was that we had not put together our 72 hour kits. So we spent the day putting those together. I've had supplies for it um, and a lot of the stuff, I've had our bags for it, but we hadn't put it together. So we did that and made sure we had our documents and things together for that. If you're not familiar with what a 72 hour kit is, it is a um, bag that you can have accessible and ready to grab on the go for each person in your household, including a pet, each pet, um, if there was an emergency that required you to leave and evacuate. So it's three days supplies of emergency essentials. Um, and there's many lists online of things to include in there. Um, so we've got ours put together now. And we have spent a lot of time with all of the aftershocks practicing our earthquake drills. <laughs> so every time we would feel an aftershock, we would take cover, you know, we would immediately practice that. So I think that that's becoming more normal for us. It's been over a week and we continue to have aftershocks. And so it's starting to settle down a bit now. Um, then we had a couple of days ago, we had our water heater leak. I was in my storage room uh, a couple days ago and we had, I was looking at some of our supplies and I saw our precious toilet paper. It's precious, you know, my precious. 
<laughs> and I was looking at it and it's on the floor and I thought, oh, we need to get our water heater strapped securely to the wall. So if there was another earthquake and it caused any, you know, too much movement and it damaged the water heater and that leaked, we wouldn't have, you know, the toilet, you know, the paper goods, as well as we have a bag of, you know, like a 25 pound bag of flour and rice and sugar or some things like that. Um, and they're just on the floor in the storage room. I have some other things in buckets, food safe buckets, but I don't have those in waterproof food safe buckets. And I thought, oh, I've got to add that to my list for the future when I can get a hold of those so that we don't have um, any loss if, if we have water heater leaking. Because I actually had that happen when I was in labor with one of my children. Our water heater broke and started flooding all over the place. And luckily my mother-in-law was there at the time and she took care of things. She's amazing. So, um, I was thinking about that while I was in my storage room and an hour later I went back in and my water heater was leaking at that time. <laughs> so my girls and I immediately cleared things out of the storage room and shut off the water. Um, it wasn't a massive like, gosh, it was a leak. So it was, you know, it was slower. So we filled up some water containers first and then turned off the water to the house. So that was another place for us to practice our emergency preparedness. We like to do emergency preparedness simulations and drills. Um, so I feel like that was one. It was just another one. My children didn't know that I didn't plan that one though, maybe. <laughs> so we have been um, just doing a lot of things like puzzles at home, school reading, playing the piano, gardening, though the weather hasn't been great. We still have snow off and on. But as soon as it clears up enough, we've been out working in the yard. Um, we want to get our garden prepped for planting. I've got all of my seeds ready. Um, I have all heirloom variety seeds so that I can collect seeds from them at the end of the year, store them and save them and put them in my storage for the next year. Um, and today we've canceled our Disneyland trip. We held off as long as we could, but we've had to cancel that as well as many other things because we just don't we don't foresee that we will be able to do those um but it's okay we're okay it's okay i i always say we're just too busy and we live in a world where everybody sees their value lies in what they accomplish and how much they do and how busy they are and this is a great time for us to reassess that and see that that's not where our value lies so we're anticipating a shelter in place um, order for this for where I live anytime now. Um, it's been in the news that they're talking about that. So that may happen. We've already been self-isolating for the last two weeks. And we have children, uh, friends, friends, children that have been getting married off and on. And today is another wedding and it will be just a couple of people. And it, they just decided yesterday they were moving it up from May to April and April to today. So um, I think that that's a wise idea and it just makes me think of World War II when a lot of soldiers were being deployed and people had no notice and they just decided, okay, let's go get married. It's time, let's go do it now. And you just really realize what matters most. So um, I think I'm just seeing a lot of good things come from this. So that's my life update. So for me, what has been going on recently, um, very similar to what you've all experienced. Um, and it's fun because, because I'm recording this separate from her, we may end up repeating each other a little bit. So forgive me if that's the case. But just like all of you everywhere, we are in um, pretty major um, separation from the world. And we, but we're doing really well. We've had some crazy things happening lately um, in our family. So as part of the, the um, I want to say quarantine, I think quarantine is sometimes um, a scary word. So I don't know if there's a better word, but in all of us coming home, my college student, Ethan, has also moved home. He moved home almost two weeks ago. And um, he's been doing his studies online. 
Um, but it's been really great to have him home. And then on Tuesday of last week, our daughter Aria, she's our 21 year old, she had been do been on a full time mission for our church, which means that she had been um, focusing on service and teaching and education and sharing our religion with other people. Um, and she had been um, anticipating to be doing that for 18 months. She was already going to be coming home in June, but because of some of her other health issues that it seemed would put her in a higher risk category were she to get the virus, she um, ended up coming home three months early. <laughs> So she has now been home for a week and a half. So we are a full house again. There, all of our children are at home and everybody's doing pretty well. We've had some health issues for Aria and for my husband that are unrelated to um, the worldwide one that we're all paying attention to, but um, they're both doing pretty well. The scariest thing that has happened is um, here in Utah, we had a, an earthquake on Wednesday of last week. So it's been just over a week and it was a 5.7 magnitude, which is a medium earthquake. Enough that it's scary, it does damage, but not um, nobody was killed or even seriously injured. But it did shake us up literally. And we have had so many aftershocks since then um, that it's been rattling, we'll just say. <laughs> Um, Deborah probably has already talked about this, so I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on that. But the result has been that everything has definitely felt um, up in the air, as I'm sure everybody is feeling. And so it's been a hard thing, but it's also been an amazing thing to have my whole family together. I had no idea um, if we would ever have a time like this where all of our kids would be home at the same time again, living in the same home again. Um, so it's a precious time. And it. my younger kids are in seventh heaven, having their big brother and their big sister home all the time. There's always somebody to hang out with. There's always somebody to... Um, play a game with or read with or talk to and I've loved seeing how well they've been getting along and just really enjoying each other so that's been really great. Um, we're pretty fortunate in that my husband has been able to continue to work. He is a mechanic and is considered to be an essential employee, um, an essential business if that makes sense to keep help keep everybody all the supply chains moving, right? And so um, he's able to continue working and luckily his work circumstances, he's not not face to face with most many people. He's usually just dealing with their cars and so he's in a pretty good situation where he is and that's been a blessing. Um, I say these things because I think they're things that everybody is, worries that everybody is facing. Um, and so, and just things that are on people's minds, you know, we're all thinking, are you healthy? Are you well? Are you able to work? How are you doing? We want to know that about each other. And so I just wanted to kind of give you that update on us. And that's how we're doing. I will also share one of the other things we've been doing is we've been doing some gardening or at least some garden prep. Um, it's halted right now because we, add insult to injury, got snow two days this week which I just think is rude, honestly. Let's just be honest, totally rude. 
but um, it's supposed to warm up again next week. So we should finish all of our garden prep for our vegetable gardens um, coming up this next week and be able to plant our cold weather vegetables. In many climates, you're already planting um, other things, but we're, we, we will just be planting cold weather cabbages, lettuces, carrots, you know, things like that that are best in cold weather climate or the, the colder seasons. But that will be really wonderful. It's been a couple of years since we've had a garden. And we've also got our seedlings. Uh, many of our seedlings started in side and sprouting and starting to look alive. So that is a joyful thing. It's nice to know that we have that to look forward to. Um, I saw a friend, Copper Crickets, um, on Instagram who was sharing that she is calling her garden a victory garden just like in World War II when we were all growing gardens we we weren't there but the the countries were growing gardens to help to support and feed um, everybody and they called them victory gardens it was a simple thing that we that people could do and I love the idea. We know that there's hard times ahead. And so I'm planting a garden, not just for my family, but in the hopes I can share with others. And I'm going to call it my victory garden. So anyway, that's what we're up to right now. So Deborah, I am really excited for you to show us your finished objects. And after Deborah finished, shows hers, I'll show mine. And then we'll do the same thing with our works in progress. And then um, Deborah has some tips she's gonna share for those of you who suddenly have your kids home and are homeschooling. And then I'm gonna share some tips for when you are just home all the time. And at the end of that, I'll have a little bit of shop news and, and that will be our podcast. So Deborah, show me your finished objects. I have, well, I'm gonna start with non-knitting. Um, this is my, we'll say it's finished section of this object. This is a quilt top that I finished piecing this week. I started this years ago. My brother-in-law got married, I don't even remember how many years ago, six, maybe? I'm terrible with that. Um, and I, my, my mother purchased fabric for a quilt. I went with her to pick it out um, according to some guidelines given by my brother and his future wife at the time and um and then i pieced it together and then we sent it out to be quilted and then my mom bound it so i did that but it was a like modern kind of flying geese quilt where um fl flying geese are these triangles with corners you're gonna have to look up what flying geese quilt blocks are. Um, they're very often used in borders around quilts, but the whole quilt was done with that, but they were large, large ones. And the quilt pattern that I was using, um, it wasn't really, um, it was just very wasteful in its use of materials. And so I had a ton when I was cutting the corners of the triangles off for the flying geese, I had a ton of triangles that we just cut off and they're, you know, you just discard them, but I had hundreds of them. And so I kept them all and made this quilt top. And I was trying to figure out how can I put it together? What kind of design could I do? And at the time, chevrons were big. I'm sure everybody remembers that phase. And so what I did is I kind of laid them out in different color sections and kind of created a fade where it went from dark brown, so big, it's hard to see, dark brown primarily into greens, lighter greens, teals, and then into navy blue or indigo. And so this is a twin size. It's not exactly a twin size quilt. It's a little bit more narrow, couple of inches short, but I mean, this is scraps that they were going to have you just toss. So these are the pieces that I cut off and I just 
sewed them into half square triangle, or I sewed the half square triangles together into squares and then put the, laid the squares out in different configurations. And I was looking at doing stars and um, pinwheels and, and I ended up just going with this. So I'm going to be tying this quilt. Well, I have to get fabric for the back. I don't have any fabric large enough. I would love to do something kind of in this range, I think. These are, I, I do love teals a lot, you can see, but I don't really like tans and browns. It's a little too earth tony for me, so I'd like to, you know, bring this color in in some really vibrant pattern for the back. Um, and then this, I'll probably tie it because in our last episode, we talked about how cozy those are. And ever since then, I've been thinking I want some more tied blankets and then that's great for cuddling up under, but it's also great for our camper. Okay. I can't fold this right here. It's too big. <laughs> I'll have to set it aside. Here's some fabrics that I kept off to the side that I'll piece together into alternating strips for the bias binding to do the quilt, to finish the quilt. I have the batting, I just need the back. Okay, another finished object. I started this, yes, and finished it since our last episode. So I did this cowl, kind of, not really faded, but because they're such faded colors, it's kind of faded. Um, no pattern. I just kind of made it up as I went. I mentioned wanting to do this a while ago. I showed this on a previous episode, all of the yarns. I have had this set aside since I think December. I just have all my little um, 20 gram mini skeins that were primarily like bare yarn with some faint speckles on them. And Let's see. Some were from, let's see, I think one was from Molly Klein Design. Most of them were from Emily's Nutcracker, I think, um, Yarnberry Yarns, the Nutcracker mini skein set. Then I had a gumball mini skein in the speckled gumball colorway of mine. And then I had another one that was a gift from I don't know where. So I just pulled out all of mine that were just these pale colors. And I used about 10 grams of each one. So I have about 10 grams left. And I started with this orangey, yellow, pinky color. Then it went into a pink color that has faint green speckles and then into a green speckled one that has some red speckles. I have two of those skeins from two different people. They're really pretty. And then this is one from the Nutcracker, for sure, the Nutcracker mini skein set from Emily that has blues and purples. And then into this one that's purples and yellows, and then into this one that was a 10 gram mini, so I used all of it, and that one has yellows and greens and oranges and some pinks and then into my speckled gumball mini that is reds blues and yellows and i just held that with mohair and it used about 35 grams of the mohair the lace weight mohair and i love it love it love it let's see if i can remember what i did so I can give you an idea. I believe I cast on 108 stitches on a US size 7 16 inch circular knitting needle. And I knit two purl two, knit two purl two, and I did that for eight rounds. And then I just divided it up evenly. Oh, how many stitches? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. I knit seven stitches. And then the next 
two stitches, I did a yarn over knit two to no, what is it? Yarn over oh I don't remember. It's where you slip one stitch over two. You slip the yarn over over two stitches. But I did that and then I just um, and then I knit around and then the next round I moved it over I moved it over one so each time I just moved the slip stitch over one and over one so every other round hi Luna every other round I knit plain and then the next one I just switched it over one switched it over one switched it over one um, and I just did that until I decided it was long enough and I did a just this is the bind off I was very loose in my bind off and I just did a regular bind off, nothing fancy. Did I? Yeah, I didn't do a sewn bind off. I was going to and decided that would be too much of a hassle with the two strands, including the mohair. I could have done it a little bit tighter, but I love it. It's great. I love cowls. I think they're one of my favorite things. Look how pretty. Oh, that is pretty. I love it. Love it. Okay. There's my official pattern. Good luck. <laughs> I think that's all I finished. Yep, that's all I finished. Okay, Emily, what have you finished? All right, so my finished objects, it's finished object, let's be honest. Well, I am going to share one more, one, one of these. So one of these I've already shown you. It's already been shown as a finished object, but it's a little update. So my Alta hat, not only is the hat finished, but guess what? So is the pattern. The pattern is finished. And by the time this airs, it will already be on my website at yarnbrary.com. So you can find this pattern available. And it is knit using one strand of fingering weight yarn, and then a strand in this one, it's um, a Surrey Alpaca Silk Blend. And this one was made in my Bronte colorway for the pink, and then my Writer's Block colorway, which is my undyed, my berry yarn for the Surrey Alpaca. And so um, it could also be knit in a DK weight yarn, or it could be used with fingering weight and mohair held together. And it has this beautiful Pico edge, that Pico trim, and it's a folded brim. So it's got that nice folded brim and it's just so fun. My test knitters have been amazing getting it all tested and finding all my mistakes that somehow I missed and making it the best it can be. So this is now available on Yarn Bray. So that's a finished object because the pattern is finished and I'm really excited about that. And I think I've mentioned this before but Alta is named after my great aunt. Her name is Alta, Alta Victoria and she is one of my favorite people. So she's um, just, she was just like my grandma and I miss her so much. So anyway, I've named this for her. And so that is my first one. So the second one that I have is this pair of socks. Very simple, but fun stripey socks. And I knit these out of these two balls of yarn, which I think are just so pretty. And I know that this one is from B and Rose. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but it, I've had it for several years. And this one, I believe was Sweet Sparrow yarns. And they just look like they belong together, don't they? So fun. In fact, when I was knitting these socks, there were several times I had to mark with a stitch marker. Usually when I do stripes, I don't use a stitch marker because the stripes keep track of the stitches for me. You know, I don't use a progress keeper. But with this one, sometimes they blend together so well right at the edges. Here, let me see if you can see that. It, it's easier to see in the camera actually than it is in person. But like right here, for example, 
It's hard to tell where one color ends and the other begins because they're all the same colors in those two yarns. It's just that one has more purple and one has more turquoise or pinky purple anyway. Um, and one thing that was fun with these, I knit this with my just regular sock recipe that I do for myself. Um, I did a slightly shorter cuff than I normally do just because I liked the way the stripes fell. And um, heel flap, turn and gusset, rounded wedge toe. But I wanted to show you the inside of this because I used a, a new method of weaving in the ends for these scrappy socks. And I found this from Kay, who is Crazy Sock Lady. If you Google Crazy Sock Lady, or go to YouTube and search for Crazy Sock Lady, she has a tutorial for how she weaves her ends in on her scrappy socks. And this is what it looks like along that, that edge where the color changes happened. And you can see that line of woven in stitches on the inside but it looks, now these are unblocked. They were on those sock blockers just so I could show you, but I haven't washed and blocked them. But just to give you an idea, I'm trying to even find which side it was on. Let's see, yep, yeah. This is what it looks like on the outside. So it really, and this is again, is unwashed, unblocked. So it's a very nice hidden transition on the outside and very fast and easy. So, um, I feel so much happier about weaving in ends on scrappy socks because honestly, scrappy socks are so cute. Aren't they just the cutest? They're so fun. But weaving in all those ends is really daunting and I really liked the little tutorial that Kay did. So I would highly recommend that you go look that up because it was, it really did make things easy. Um, and it made, it made me not dread that part of it. It went super fast to weave all those in and to trim them and to make them look tidy. I think that's the biggest thing. It's even less about how much work it is as like, how is it gonna look when you're all done? And there, it looks beautiful. Look at that, it doesn't look bad at all. There's no like major wonky stitches happening right there. Because it's one thing to do the work, but if you do the work and then you look at it and you don't like the finished product, then that's really annoying. And that's kind of the experience I'd had with a couple of my scrappy socks where I thought, well, they look cute, but that edge just ruins it for me. So um, I really liked that. And that is all I have finished because you would think that being home all the time would mean I could knit all the time. But I, ha I mean, I have done plenty, don't get me wrong. But I just, yeah, it's been kind of a crazy time for life. And so that's just kept me really busy. So now I've shown my finished objects. So Deborah, I want to see your works in progress. All right. Now, what am I working on? What am I working on? Oh, Luna. Luna has been so needy. So needy. Yeah, I think she hasn't been feeling well. She's been just wanting to cuddle. Ever since the earthquake, she's been extra needy. She's been very skittish. Um, okay, what am I working on? I am working on, let me get it out. I showed this last time. I've made very little progress. I don't even know if it's worth showing. It's been so little. This is the bath mat that I'm making for our camper and I included a link in the previous video of how I did this stitch. It's a tutorial of how this is done. I've got to weave in these ends. This is my number one reason for not wanting to crochet. I don't like weaving in crochet ends. I don't know why. It's not as easy. Like with knit, you just do a duplicate stitch. With this, I have to like try and where do I want to work it? And is that going to be secure enough? And it just, I don't want you to see it. It just, it's a bath mat, seriously. If I tied it in a knot and glued it down on the back, I wouldn't even know. Maybe that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah. So I'm using um, three balls of cotton yarn from Hobby Lobby. There, I love this cotton. And 
I showed these last time. This one has some light speckles on it. And it just looks like it's going to be kind of like braided when it's all done. So I need to do this three stripe section. I'm trying to remember, I think it was five times. One, two, three, four, five. And then one more of this. That is if I even have that much yarn. I don't even know. I don't know how much it will take. So if I have enough, that's what I'm gonna do. If not, I'll end when I run out of yarn and that's what it will be. But I think it's gonna work great for our motorhome. Just a little tiny space. We don't have much room. I mean, it's like that big little tiny space. So um, that will make it really nice. This is in a bag that I made years ago. I love this print. Luna, what did you find? What did you find? Okay. I'm also, I started another scrappy project. I really love scrappy projects. And then, but I don't always love wearing them. So this was one that I liked because it doesn't look too scrappy. So for me, I'm not a scrappy kind of girl. I like more solid, bold, um, all over color, like how these are nice, bold, wide stripes and it's not all variegated. But I love to knit with them and I love to collect those yarns. So this was one that I thought worked really well for me. So I often will knit them and then give them to somebody that I know that that would be something that they would love. But this is one that I do love and I'll show you why. Did a scrappy sock, oh, isn't that so happy? That is like the happiest springtime sock ever. Did you hear that? That was my shoulder. Kind of normal everything creaks and cracks so i divided i separated the scrappy colors all of the mixed up colors with a solid white and i think that just broke it up and separated and defined them instead of them kind of being all right next to each other and seeming too chaotic for me i think that's what it is, is it just feels too chaotic and this helped bring a sense of order and now i love it so I did the cast on and one round of ribbing with one color. And then I knit the ribbing. This is from Emily um, at Yarn Brewery Yarn. This is Emily's candy floss sock um, cuff pattern. And I did the rest of the cuff in the natural color. And then I did nine rounds of my pattern, of my whatever, happy color. And then five rounds of plain nine, five, nine, five, nine, five. Then I did a slip stitch heel flap and heel turn nine rounds, five, nine round. Okay. And then when I got to the end, I did a colorful toe. What took me the longest was working out the math of how to do this so that, um, I would end with a white stripe here and that I would end with a white stripe before doing the toe. That's what took me the most time because if you've watched me for a while, you know that I want my socks to do this. I'm gonna show you. When I fold them in half, I want them to be the same size, the foot and the leg. And so I knew if I could figure out the amount of rounds that I needed per color, per stripe, um, Luna, you're so noisy. If I could figure that out for the foot, then I could just repeat that for the leg, mostly. So what I have are one, two, three, I have four stripes of the color, and then I have one that's like the center one that's in the very middle, it divides them all up. And this all started because I got a handful of minis that were adorable, adorable from um, Cherie, Ollie and, Ollie and Bella. 
She also does daily vlogs, which she just stopped doing. Um, but she gave me some for Christmas. Christmas? No, we just did a swap. We just did a swap. And these are some of them. And I can't, you can't see. I Some of the labels are coming off. And they were so happy that I wanted to use those. And I was going to use just these. And then I kept finding more colors that I thought, oh, well, that will be cute in there. And then I got some um, minis from a friend that... Um, Melissa at Nitty by Nature that I that were from Kate Celine she sent me for my birthday and they were so cute I'm like well I have to add those so I was doing that I realized well I actually really need some more colors in there to help balance it out and these are from Emily from mini sets that I have from her from various minis and some are from the Nutcracker mini set and some are from others so I obviously really like Emily's yarn because I keep using it again and again so um I've done one sock and I've got the next one started love them love them no I did not weave in ends as I went like where you weave the ends in as you knit and you knit kind of over them. I didn't do that. I did them um, after I did the leg, after I knit the leg, I went back and sewed in the ends because that's just a million ends. It really is. And then after I did the foot, before I did the toe, I went and did those, and then I did the toe at the very end. So I've been doing that with this sock, kind of weaving in ends here and there as I go. I'll just slide it over to the cable flip it right side out and start weaving in ends. So that has made it so it's not as overwhelming at the very end. But I love it, love it, love it. And I have enough to knit like 17 billion more. <laughs> okay, and that's in a bag that I made myself years ago with another adorable fabric. It's a Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Okay, and my last work in progress is a Whitmore sweater. I showed this last time. It is so soft, so pretty. Amy worked so hard on making sure that this design had lots of features to suit a lot of different body types and it's great for all varieties of knitters like experience it's just so well written so this is a sweater for my daughter she picked the color and helped me kind of fine tune the color that she wanted and i am ready to do oh okay they're not i'm ready to do the cuff on this sleeve and then i can cast on or pick up stitches here to do the next sleeve, I have been alternating skeins, which is a good thing. You can kind of see how you get variation in it. Um, and that would have really pooled and you would have noticed that dramatically if I hadn't alternated the skeins, even though they were dyed in the same pot, the same time, you know, it just depends on how the dye hits and what part of the pot and how it, you know, you just have to, to know that. And so, um, I've been using helical knitting for alternating skeins. So easy. So easy. I've included a link for how I've done that in the past. I'm trying to remember if I showed that last time how I did it. No, I didn't. I didn't show that. But there's a lot of tutorials that show you how to do it. And so this one is almost ready, which is good because winter is ending so if I finish it in the next week my daughter might have a chance to wear it once <laughs> doesn't matter sweaters last and then yesterday I dyed yarn for my other daughter for Ella this is the color she wants here oh let's look at the two side by side so this will be Nadia's and this will be Ella's they're so pretty. So pretty. Love it. 
And I also dyed some more yarn for um, another sock. Ooh, I'm kind of, well, sometimes I go through stages where I'm over knitting socks. Like I'm done, I don't wanna knit anymore. And then I do something else for four seconds and then I wanna do socks again. But my mother has requested a pair of socks and she was specific in her request. She wants um, an all over pattern and she liked cables, but she wasn't set on cables. But what she was specific about is she wanted a denim blue, not solid. She wanted it to look like jeans where it had blips, you know, white blips in your jeans, how they're not usually just completely solid. And so I dyed a 50 gram skein And I think that turned out great. What do you think? Does that look like denim? I seriously was holding it up against my leg, well, was my jeans, like, yeah, I think that does. So I hope this is what she wants because everybody will have a different idea. You have something in your mind of what you're picturing, but denim can be so different. But um, I need to decide what color I want to do for, I think I'll do cuffs and no, maybe I'll do heels and toes. I, either way, I'll do two. <laughs> got fluff, got mohair. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll show you the options. You tell me what you think. Here's this one. Here's the first option. Okay. My mother loves pink, but she hates purple. These are actually not for her. These are for a gift for somebody. Okay, so there's that one. Then there's this one, which is very happy summery. This was a mini from Emily. I like that one. That one's really bold. So of course I like that because, you know, I like really bold things. And then this is the one that I like that just goes with like everything. This is my speckled gumball colorway. Um, this one is my high twist base, 8020 super wash merino nylon. And this is Not the high twist, and I'm trying to remember. This would create a just slightly, slightly different gauge, but not enough that it, I think it's gonna be a problem to combine them. But these two are the same base as the denim. I don't remember where this came from, so I don't know the name of it. I just have a stash of minis. Hmm, I like them all. I'm leaning towards these, one of these, because I think my mom probably won't like this one quite as much. Anyways, that's what I am working on. Besides growing my hair out, this is going to be the work in pro pro progress. I'm not growing it longer. I've just decided that if I'm not going to be seeing people and people aren't going to be seeing me so much, that this is a time to find out what my natural hair color looks like. So I have stuff for dyeing my hair to keep dyeing it, but I've been thinking about doing that for a long time. I love bright colors, but maybe it's time to, time to see what it actually looks like. I haven't seen what my natural hair color is really for 15 years. It could be frightening. It could be really scary. So this is a time that I'm grateful that I'm a beauty school dropout. Beauty school dropout. Ooh. So, <laughs> oh, I remember when I was going to beauty school, my father um, mentioned that that was not a real um, choice for an education, that I needed to get a real education. I think he thought that for about four seconds because then when I started cutting his hair, he's like, actually, this is very helpful. 
And at this point in time, I'm going to tell you, while everybody is isolated, cutting their own hair with their kitchen scissors, you're going to wish that you had even a fraction of the beauty school training. <laughs> Sorry, cosmetology school training. I'm just going with the Greece, the music from Greece. But um, yeah, I, I ended up leaving cosmetology school like three months before I was finished. I was so burned out. There were a lot of reasons why, but I did it while I was in high school. I was going to early morning seminary, which is a religious studies class. That's, I think it started at 5.30 in the morning. And then I went to cosmetology school part-time. And then I went and took two classes at high, in our high school. And then I went and worked part-time in the evenings at a salon. I was the receptionist. And then I came home and crashed. And I did that six days a week, six days a week. I don't remember if that was five or six days a week. Yeah, on the sixth day I worked at the salon full time and I was exhausted and so burned out and decided I hated doing hair. <laughs> and I've pretty much felt that way ever since. I just don't like doing it, but I have the skills to do it. So I highly suggest all of you Get online, order a pair of hair cutting scissors. Don't use your kitchen scissors, your sewing scissors. They're not going to cut it. No pun intended. Get some hair cutting scissors and then watch some YouTube tutorials. You want to learn a basic, straight, blunt cut for girls to, you know, how to cut the back of the hair. A very basic how to trim your bangs. Um, don't watch all of the do it at home kind of thing where people are experimenting. Go to the professionals that show you how to actually do it. And then you want to learn like a basic contour cut for men. And um, then if you want any layers for women, those are the four that I would say. Blunt, straight cut, um, bangs, contour cut for men and layering for women. Though there's a million different types of contouring and a million different types of layering and different types of bangs and, um, and then variations on all of those. But I suggest doing that. So um, rather than ending up looking like this. Yeah. I suggest that maybe you learn a little bit more before you start hacking away. <laughs> but pretty soon we're going to know what everybody's natural hair color looks like. Yeah. So that are that is what I have been working on. What about you, Emily? All right. So my work's in progress. I do have several. I'm hoping I can show them to you without throwing things all over the floor. That would be the real trick. So first up is my scrappy cardigan. So I have now finished the body of this cardigan. Oh, look, that yarn looks familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> I finished the body of it and done my ribbing on the bottom. And I like how it's turning out. It is definitely eclectic. It's not gonna go with everything, but it's gonna go with plenty. <laughs> it'll be fun. I wear a lot of navy, and so I think it'll go really well with you know, jeans and a t-shirt or something. It'll be casual, it's fun. And these are yarns that were just sitting around not doing anything. Now they're having a party and a cardi. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, I am using Hohi Locatelli's Sparkle Cardigan as kind of the base for this cardigan. This is what the pattern is. Um, I am omitting all of the texture. I have completely changed the armhole and side. Um, I didn't want a really deep armhole, so I made the armhole smaller and I've made it slightly A-line. This is horribly wrinkled from being in my bag. And it's got so many notes written all over it. This is the same thing that I did with my lime green cardigan that I've talked about in past episodes. So 
that's what I'm using. Um, I'm also not planning on putting an actual button band in it. I mean, I will do the, the ribbing trim, but I'm not planning on buttoning it, wearing it as an open cardigan. So anyway, I got to this point and I had finally decided that this color, which again is the Bronte, my Bronte color, which I wanna show you the difference between this by itself and this with alpaca, the Surrey alpaca. So this is it with a strand of undyed Surrey alpaca and this is what it looks like without it. Anyway, so this is gonna be my trim color. So I will be doing the ribbing on the bottom of the sweater, obviously, then the cuff on both sleeves and then the button band will all be in this Bronte colorway to try and just kind of tie this all together. These yarns are all yarns that were either scraps from former projects or partial skeins that were given to me by my wonderful friend, Nikki, um, who is Clara Pegatty on Instagram. I have something to tell you about that actually. In fact, I'm just gonna pause right here and tell you, Nikki is a goddess of weaving. She has woven me a blanket. Um, she's still finishing it up, but um, she, I sent her some of my yarns from my shop and she has made me a blanket. Um, oh my goodness, it is amazing amazing in fact um here we'll insert this video of nikki unrolling the or kind of the reveal of her taking it off the loom It is so fantastic. I just cannot even tell you. I like I watched that video when she sent it to me probably four times in a row because I just can't imagine how amazing that is. She's so good. So it's gonna take a while till I can get it um, because she's in England, I'm in America, and our we can't send things to each other right now. But oh my goodness, I am so excited about this blanket. So anyway, I had to share that in the middle of all of this. <laughs> but anyway, the whole point is that she sent me this yarn and that one, that one. This one's a repeat from up above. So these are all, all yarns that she sent to me um, that she thought I would like, which I do, obviously, since I'm knitting them into my cardigan. So that is really fun. Um, I'm taking a little break on that just because I wanted to work on some other things, but um, just really enjoying that. And it's gonna be fun to get that one done and have another cardigan. I really decided I really just love knitting sweaters. All right, another work in progress. What do I wanna show next? This one. So this one is kind of boring to show, although it's so pretty, because you can't really tell how much progress I'm making at any given moment. But this is my terrace wrap. The pattern is by Sir Pearl Soho, Pearl Soho. Um, and I am knitting it in my Opera Dancer's Daughter colorway. And I'm knitting it on a size six needle. The pattern calls for a size four. This pattern is free on the Pearl Soho website. And it's just a wrap, um, a rectangular wrap, although the stitch does make it go onto the bias um, without any changing or, you know, it's not about decreases and increases. It's just the stitch naturally lays that way. And so you get kind of this nice bias um, drape. And once this blocks out, it's gonna be t almost twice as big anyway. So I've made, I've knit about this much, not a lot, but about that much since the last time I showed it. It had been kind of hibernating and I've just pulled it out again and been working on it the last couple of days. And it's so pretty. Ooh, it's so pretty. 
Oh yeah, I just really, really love that. Isn't that color just, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that. I just, <laughs> it sounds a little tooting my own horn, but I love peaches so much. The color, all the shades of peach. And um, I am keeping this in my gorgeous dandelion and dogwood bag with the pin. And look at these progress keepers, Amy. She's my style guru. She's amazing. So anyway, that's that one. All right. Hopefully, Deborah, you're not bored yet and all my other friends. One more knitting work in progress for right now. I think just one. Have to check around, yes. I've actually pulled out my two panel blanket. So I started this months and months ago. I was inspired by Hohi Locatelli, who um, she, I believe what she had said in her journal, this again is months ago, but was that they had a blanket that was similar to this um, when she was younger and she wanted to replicate it. I think, hopefully I'm telling you that story correctly. And the idea is that I'm knitting two long panels. So this is about 25 inches wide and I'm planning on knitting it 50 inches in length. And then I'll knit two of those and I will put a nice big obvious seam, probably a crocheted seam with like a, so you can see those crochet stitches running up the, the seam. I want it to be a visible decorative seam. Um, and then it will be like a crib size blanket or a baby blanket. That's my plan. This is the squishiest, most delicious fabric that this is making. It is bouncy and amazing. And I am knitting it on a size, US size 10 needle, which is how many millimeters is that? You'd think I'd know by now, right? I don't use large needles that often. It is a six millimeter needle. And I'm knitting it with um, anywhere from worsted to a heavier DK held with a strand of fingering weight. And um, I'm just marling, again, scraps and little partial skeins. I say partial skeins because to me a scrap is something that you, I don't know, 20 grams or less, that's a scrap. But if it's 50, 60 grams, I don't call that a scrap, but it's not a full skein anyway. Hope that makes sense. Um, and I'm just marling it. So I'm knitting until my, my yarn runs out. For example, I just ran out of this kind of rose magenta fingering weight that's been held through this section here. And I just barely started adding in a strand of this gray green to this yarn. So anyway. That's kind of how I'm doing it. And I love it. Isn't it fun? It's very mindless. It doesn't take any work. It's just knit, knit, knit. It's garter stitch. But the size 10 needles do fatigue my hands. And so I can only work on it for so long before my hands get tired. But it is really good to watch a movie or listen to an audiobook while I'm working on it, which I have been doing plenty of both, let's be honest. Isn't that fun though? I love the look of it. I think it's just really nice. And interestingly enough, my son Ethan, who is a very linear, precise personality, <laughs> does not usually appreciate most of the things I make for myself. He appreciates the skill and the work, but he doesn't look at them and go, oh, that's so nice looking. Because honestly, if he saw that scrappy sweater, which he hasn't, he would just be like, why would you do that? <laughs> random colors in random widths of stripes. It would just break his head. But he really likes this <laughs> for some reason, probably because the colors are a lot bolder, especially right through the section. So anyway, he said, oh, whatever that is, you're knitting. I like that. So that's kind of fun. So that is going on. All right. I have just one more work in progress that I'm going to show right now. Um, I have some quilting and things, but they're honestly, they're kind of hard to show by myself and there's not enough progress that they're fun to look at yet. So we will just show those another time. 
All right. So speaking of crochet, I think I was speaking of crochet. When was I speaking of crochet? Oh yeah, when I said the crochet seam, that was it. I have been working on this Between Meals centerpiece, which is a very large crochet doily. I think the word doily is just a funny one. It's not quite as bad as moist, but it's in the same category. Because <laughs> doily, it just doesn't sound classy, right? <laughs> Anyway, this is the Between Meal Centerpiece. Um, it is a free pattern that you can find online. I mean, you can Google it and you can find it really easily. It's, um, let's see, it's from the Corticelli. There's a Corticelli book. But if you just Google Between Meal Centerpiece Crochet, you'll find it. It's free. Um, it's from 1912, I believe. It's a vintage booklet and you can download it. And um, anyway, and I am working on that. I think I have shown this before. So this is to replace the one, yes, I did show it last time. This is to replace the one that I have crocheted of the same thing before that was destroyed by my naughty youngest daughter when she was very little. Oh, I've been showing you the back side. Here's the front side. Not that it looks much different on the camera. <laughs> Anyway, it's coming along. It still has quite a ways yet to go. Um, I know though, I am not doing as good a job this time as I did the first time I made it. I don't crochet as much as I used to and my gauge is looser and I'm just not, it's just not as tight and neat. So for example, you can see my little loops um, in, in a really well-made one. These would almost disappear. I don't know if that's the right word to say, but they would just be smaller and tidier. Now, blocking will help, but only to a certain extent. But you know what? I really miss having this. It was such a beautiful piece to have on my dining room table. Um, and I like having a home covered in homemade things. And so I just miss it. So I'm making it again, but I've made a lot of progress. I think I was clear back about right here when I showed it last. So that is a lot of crocheting right there for how big that is. This is knit in size 10 cro mercerized crochet thread. Um, Aunt Lydia's, I think is what I'm using. And I am using a two millimeter hook. This is the hook I'm using. And just buzzing along on that. Again, crochet hurts my hands, so I can only do it for so much. But I've been able to do more than I thought I would. Like I said, I've knit or crocheted about that much in the last week or so. Um, I just, I can only do it for so much time each day, but I have been working on it every day and really enjoying it. But because I've been doing this, I haven't worked on my granny stripe blanket and it's really close. So I really do want to work on that. But there's just only so much one girl can do. I think that is all of my works in progress. It is. I am going to be um, starting another Little Cotton Rabbits pattern for a friend of mine who is creating, um, she's a, a non-knitter, non-crafter friend of mine, but she has admired my, my little animals I've made from afar <laughs> and she finally reached out and said, I am starting to create um, a grandma's treasures box because she has two kids who are expecting. And um, so her first two grandchildren on the way and she's just been hoping for one of those. And um, I told her I would make her one. So um, she left up to me which animal, what gender to make it, like what clothes I would make it, all of that. And so I'm trying to decide what to do. I've been, I've been dream knitting one of those. So I'll get to work on that soon. But yeah, that's all my works in progress. So Deborah, why don't you share with us what your homeschooling tips are? Okay, so I thought, Emily and I were talking about what it is that we wanted to share with you today. We usually do a kindness is like sugar segment and 
we're going to give you, I think, hopefully a little bit of kindness in sharing some of our homeschooling tips. Are you guys sick of those yet? Because everybody is now has now become a homeschooler. Welcome to the club. We've been doing it for, I don't know how long Emily's been doing it. Let's see. Ten. I've been doing it for 10, 11 years now, I think. 11 years now. And um, I'm gonna give you my top three tips. And Emily's also given me a couple of thoughts in here that she that I'll just kind of include with that because she and I really just are on the same page with it. We were talking about it and we're like, yeah, that's kind of the same for each of us. So top tip number one. All right, life is in a great upheaval right now. And so um, this is a good time for you to simply detox <laughs> and to try and find and settle into a new normal and everybody panics when you say that and forget and think no I don't really need that and you don't listen and then after a little while you settle down and go okay actually I do and you go back and do the detox I did the same thing when I started homeschooling I did the exact same thing um, but if so Emily and I we really like the Thomas Jefferson Education's leadership education model and um they said about this this was kind of their analogy they said have you ever been in a play i think a lot of you have or you've had children that have been in a play or know people when you're in a play it becomes the rhythm of your life you eat drink and sleep those people those words that whole body of work then closing night is passed and suddenly you fall into the show hole Everything you were about is suddenly gone. You hated the confinements and stress of the project in a lot of ways. I know that with my girls in ballet. While you're in the middle of it, it's really hard and overwhelming and you can't wait till you're done with it. And when it's over, you feel this aimless void of purpose and you start reliving the high points and wanting something to bring those back. You walk around quoting your lines, finding some bizarre comfort in the connection with the old routine you hated so much. Yeah? Feeling like you're in a void of nothingness without the high-paced, regimented time sucker that was your life just a few days before. If you think about that, this is your kid's brain right now. Coming off of a regimented school schedule, just like the one you're leaving behind. And this is why detox is a big thing. The longer they are in a highly structured and um, model, which is typical for public schooling, the longer it takes to kind of detox and to break that down and, and to work through the emotions and settling down and finding a new normal. It takes more time. So the longer they've been doing that, the more time it takes to detox. Um, so just take time with your family to deter determine your core needs for your family. Determine what they are and work on those. Um, one great thing to do during this time is to work with your children, play with your children, and read aloud. Read aloud to them um, individually with them, have them read to you. Read aloud, that is my number one favorite thing. My children love um, readathons, or they, they did when they were really little. They loved, we would have family reading time every night. We'd gather around, we've read so many series together. Um, now that they're older, they all have different interests of what they want to read, but um, yesterday I found my daughter. She had created her own little readathon spot under the piano, made a little fort, got her books in there, and was just having her own personal reading time. And then I found my girls reading to each other. It's great. So that's number one. Number two, we've heard this before, but it's so true. So Fred Rogers, he quoted somebody else and added his own words to it. So I'm gonna give you Fred Rogers quote. He says, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. So number two tip is play. Let the kids play, give them free time, unstructured time and play with them. If you're doing, you know, if they're drawing with chalk, chalk, go out onto the sidewalk and draw with them. Do the things that they're doing. Encourage them. Um, be silly. 
but just play. That is the best way to learn anyways, is through experimentation and play and creativity. Um, that really is the core need of children up until they are, I'm trying to remember what age range this is, eight, until they're about eight, that's the main need for their education is play. Um, and still beyond that, we all need to go back and revisit those core needs regularly and especially in a time of crisis. So number two is play with your children, let them play, just relax. And the third one is children will remember for a lifetime how they felt during times of crisis and major change, far more than anything that they will have learned um, academically. I mean, for a lifetime, that's what will stick with them rather than did they remember all of those facts and things that they were trying to memorize and, and the tests and things like that. They will remember if they were so stressed and if they were having a terrible relationship with their mother and father who are trying to suddenly jump in and be the teacher and everything all at once. You know, it's, it's stressful. It's a stressful time. And so take time with your family to um, discuss what are the things that they want to be learning about and how, how do they envision schooling look to them. Um, and we just talked about that, that detox time, that talk with them about that. What does this detox time look like to them um, rather than just telling them, okay, this is what we're doing. Anytime you have a part in choosing what it is that you're gonna be doing, you're more invested in doing it than if you're just told what to do. Um, and one thing just to remember is that education occurs when students get excited about learning and applying themselves. So if they are excited about it and they are choosing it, that's when education happens. When it's forced on you, it, you know, there's this wall and you, I'm sure that you're all seeing that wall that's just there, that barrier that happens. So let's just kind of break down that wall and allow the children to determine some of those things. And that sounds very scary to a lot of people, but everybody's in the same boat right now. Everybody is feeling anxious about, about how to do this. And so just relax and enjoy time with your family. So those are my, my I say my, but it's also Emily's, top three homeschooling and education tips. So now Emily, she's going to have some tips for those of you that don't um, educate your children at home, that may not have children that you are working with right now. She has tips for staying at home. All right, so I'm gonna share a few of my little things that help me to stay sane while being home all the time. We're all kind of in the same boat right now. And, um, I actually have been finding a lot of parallels from this experience to an experience I had back in 2013. I was really sick. Um, it was a kind of a combination of several things. I had a surgery that I didn't recover well from, followed by getting mono and then some other things that all just perfect storm came together and I ended up sick in bed um, and I was almost completely bedridden for about five months. Um, why is this the same? Um, it's the same because of the fact that if you had asked me any time up to that point, if I would like to spend a week in bed with people bringing me food and nobody asking me to do anything, would I want to do that? And of course I would have jumped up and down and said, please and thank you. I would love to spend a week in bed. I would love to just lay in bed and read and have somebody bring me food when I needed it and have nothing expected of me other than to take a shower occasionally and use the restroom, right? Just, just a break. It's completely different when you are so ill that you can't do anything. And that's why nobody is asking that of you. Um, and I know that there are many of our, our friends who watch our podcast who have had experiences like that or who could even be going through that right now. Um, the thing about that is that it completely changes how you feel about the experience and your ability to enjoy it in a lot of ways because you feel horrible. And so 
you know, it's not a vacation. It's, it's arduous. Um, because of that, I feel kind of a similar experience to this, because if you had asked me a month ago, how would I feel if everything on my calendar suddenly got canceled and I could just stay home and all I had to worry about was feeding my family, like the only things I had to do was making food for my family, homeschooling, you know, just the stuff that like normal at home things. I would have said, yes, please. And thank you. <laughs> It's, it's harder though when it's a different thing. For one thing, it's not all we have to worry about. We have other things that we're worrying about too. But it's a different thing when you can't go get a break when you need it. You can't um, go visit your friends. You can't sit with your sister side by side to record a podcast. You know, those things are hard. Um, but there are things that I learned from my experience when I was in bed for those five months that have really helped me now. Um, and so I wanted to share just a few of those things with you. For one, one of them right now is don't stress about the things that you can't do anything about. Um, I, that, I know that's easier said than done, but I think that a better way of saying that is focus on the things that you can do something about. Um, and so one of the things that we've been focusing on a lot at our home is just having fun together, not trying to impose normal routine, like normal, not trying to make our normal life outside of this coronavirus happening now. Um, but, but still having routines and good things, but, but not trying to make it perfect. Like, like this image of what I would think was perfect, right? Instead, what is the feeling we're creating? And so we're having a lot of fun. And in fact, right now, there may be some background noise because my kids are upstairs playing a game together and laughing and just having a ball. There are two doors closed between us, but that may not matter with how loud they can get. And I would so much rather have them laughing up there and having a great time than worrying about about whether or not that's making too much noise. That's a little thing, but carrying that through other things. I can't control what's in stock in the grocery store and I can't control um, what the weather is like or if we have an earthquake, you know, there are all kinds of things I can't control. So I can focus on what I can control and I can control how we use our time, the kinds of um, meals that I'm making. I can control, um, our, our um, bedtime routines and how well that happens to a certain extent. I can control how much I um, interact with my loved ones. Um, and so I'm focusing on those things. So that's the first one. The second one is you need to have an outside contact every day if you can. Um, and I, when I say outside contact, that may not be leaving your house. Sometimes you may not have that option, but you can have contact with somebody outside your house. And I find that the easiest way for me to do that is to think of somebody else who might need a lift or a boost and to reach out to them. If I do that, then I don't have a predetermined expectation of what I'm going to get out of that experience. And therefore, I can just enjoy it for whatever it is. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing is just sending texts to people in my neighborhood, um, especially those who I know may be, who, who are elderly, who may not have other people able to come and see them, um, or who live alone, who may be feeling really isolated right now. Um, I just will send a text and say, hey, I was thinking of you. I'll look for funny little gifts or pretty little, you know, pictures or whatever to send them or send them even a snapshot of me making a funny face at them saying, hey, you know, this is your crazy friend. Just checking in to see how you're doing. Um, so that's one thing um, we can do. Um, we've also been working on sending out cards and notes. Um to the same kind of group of people. Um, my daughter, Abby, and a bunch of her friends put together a bunch of cards that are thank you cards to healthcare workers. Um, and they're being delivered to the local hospital to um, another of our friends who works there who is gonna distribute them to some of the healthcare workers. So those are things that we can do to reach out to somebody and have an outside contact every day. The third one is get outside 
you know what i love all of the the memes and things that i've seen going around that says what isn't closed you know what's not closed well going for a walk in the park is not closed um you know things that get you outside where you are not interacting face to face or hand to hand with other people um those things are available to us let's utilize them um, get some fresh air, get out in the wind and the sun and the rain, you know, as much as you can just to, to get out and enjoy it. Um, and the last thing is just to talk about how you're really doing to people. Um, I think that that was one of the things that was hardest for me um, when I was in bed was that I felt guilty for being a burden. I felt like I didn't have anything to offer and so I just tried to not ever share how I was really doing. People would ask how I was, I'm fine, I'm great, I'm fine, thank you, you know, I didn't want to burden them. Not only with like my kids were already being, my and my husband were already being burdened with taking care of me and so I didn't want to burden them with the emotional side of things but I did have a few people I could talk to including my sister. And then I could share how I was really doing. And when I did, it seemed smaller because as soon as I was able to talk about it and get it out, I realized the list of the complaints actually was finite, if that makes sense. Sometimes if you just think about it, it just spins in your head and you go from worry A to worry B to worry C and then you start back at A again and you don't realize that I mean, it just seems never ending. It just cycles and cycles and cycles. But when I could actually get it out and talk to somebody about it, I realized that it was a finite. I mean, even if the list is long, it still has an end to the list. And that I could get through it because I was able to talk about it. So have somebody to talk to. And you can always reach out to me if you want to talk. So, um... That, that was those were some of the things that really helped me one last little recommendation I know this part has been probably ridiculously long one last little recommendation though Abby and I are putting together what we're calling our can can so she was also having some issues with all of the things that have been canceled and all of the things that she can't do and so I let her talk about that and get through her list and then once she got through her list, we started taking turns. And I said, what are, you know, I said one thing that we can do. And then she said one thing that we can do. And we went back and forth and we decided we were gonna find a can, like a tin can, an aluminum can, whatever they are, left over from our vegetables or something. And um, wash it out and put a label on it that just says can. And then we're going to write all kinds of things that we can do on our little pieces of paper and fold them up and put them in that so that when we're feeling like there's nothing we can do, we can pull that out and our can 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 tell us something that we can do. So that's one other thing I wanted to share with you. All right, my last thing to share is shop news. Um, I had gone back and forth and back and forth over whether I was going to still be releasing my advent calendars on April 1st. Um, I, I, I put a little story of this up on Instagram for those of you who follow me over on Instagram, but um, I just had had a hard time knowing how to strike the right balance between share your business and then feeling like maybe I'm being insensitive and in talking about business in the midst of everything else that we're dealing with right now. Um, but I got so much positive feedback saying that it's great to share and people like it and it's a great relief. And so, or, or to be thinking about things other than um, coronavirus and um, other worries related to that. And so I have decided I will release my first batch of, um, of, um, Christmas Advent calendar listings will still go up on April 1st. So that is next week. That's crazy. I can't believe that's already next week. So those will go up and they will, they are based on the theme of Elf, the movie Elf. So excited about that. Um, and I'm really, really excited. I will release 
these listings in three different sections. So it will probably be April and then June and then August will be the three listings and we'll see how they go and then, you know, make alterations to that if necessary. But I will be putting that first that first bundle of them up. My goal with this is that um, I know it's a big expense for people and I want people to either have the time they need to plan ahead by having those later listings or for those of those who want to take advantage of early listings so they don't have to think about that when it gets closer to their Christmas shopping for everybody else. Um, so anyway, I, will, I like there to be options open for everybody and that seemed to work really well last year. So we're gonna continue that this year. So those will be going up on April 1st. In the meantime, the shop is open. I have authors colorways. I still have a few Jane Austen colorways. I have Emma colorways all listed. Um, I did not, I wasn't smart and brought things down to show you. So that's very silly of me. But anyway, the shop is open and, um, and so it's all there. And I think that's everything I have to share. I am super excited to be able to watch all of Deborah's sections and see everything that she has made. I know you're seeing them all now. You've seen it all concurrently, but I haven't yet. So I'm excited to see that. Um, I just love all of you, love being part of your lives in this little way. And I wish you all the very, very best. Um, and being healthy and being well and and knowing that we're all in this together. And that's all I have to share with you right now. We'll see you soon. Bye. Love you a lot. Hope to see you again.